So the first lecture is more about uh, the background of, uh, of pathway network analysis, why you really want to do that. Uh, so the learning objectives are the following. Uh, you want to identify the situations where pathway network analysis would be useful, uh, and then understand the main two components. Uh, so first of all, the gene sets, uh, the functional knowledge about genes, and then the gene list, something that you have derived from your experiment. And then uh, bioinformatics oftentimes is a, it's about understanding gene identifiers, and gene identifiers are really important in pathway network analysis. You want to make sure that you work on your gene of interest, not something that sounds really similar uh, in the identifiers. Um, and then we also want to understand how annotated gene sets such as biological processes or pathways, how they are really derived from the literature and where do we get them originally. So I'm sure that uh, in the age of omics, every one of you has encountered this particular situation. Uh, that you've done this new fancy screen, or maybe you've done some next generation sequencing, proteomics, what have you, uh, and you uh, produce the large list of genes or proteins. And uh, maybe it's in the dozens, then you're lucky, you can do some sort of literature research, but it could also be in the hundreds of thousands. And then there's no meaningful way of uh, manually understanding hundreds of thousands of genes unless you're really keen. So, uh, in a very typical experiment, uh, we often use the, uh, uh, the most simplest approach or most common approach of RNA, um, mRNA interpretation here. But then uh, keep in mind that pathway network analysis is applicable to many other omics data sets. So, for example, you may have done a microarray experiment or these days an RNA seq experiment, uh, derived a lot of samples and performed some initial statistical analysis maybe ranking uh, your genes or clustering your genes, and you have a gene list. And then you also have a big question mark, what do you do next? And then you really want to use some automated techniques in order to understand your gene list and in order to interpret your experiment through that gene list and eventually publish something interesting. So there is a myriad of analytical tools and approaches that all go under the umbrella of pathway and network analysis that essentially deal with that situation. So uh, having your... Uh, computation analysis of experimental data and your gene list at hand, uh, you will use automated tools to analyze the existing knowledge about these genes, uh, their pathways, networks, and, uh, and processes uh, in order to uh, interpret the gene list, find something about the mechanism, and tell something new to the scientific audience. So the classical approach of this uh, involves the PubMed database. So you have your ranked gene list, you go through that one by one. Some of those genes you probably know because you worked on the problem before, and some of those genes are novel. And you can uh, totally go to the pathway, uh, the PubMed database, and start going gene by gene, and yeah, then you sure, surely be buried in the scientific literature very soon, because each, paper, each gene will have you know, maybe dozens of papers, but maybe hundreds or thousands of papers if it's a more commonly studied gene. So you don't want to do that, and instead you want to do automated approaches. Um, and then, then this is a large overview slide of how complicated the problem really is, as you all are having access to these genome-wide or protein-wide technologies, uh, you can query uh, essentially snapshots of cells of everything that's going on to certain limitations. And then you want to take advantage of uh, decades of existing literature that has been studied about these genes and proteins to be able to explain what you see in the data and then various parts that go into that uh, uh, analytical pipeline would be previous experiments and predictions, uh, databases of biological knowledge, uh, literature and also expert curation so maybe you have uh, good collaborators to talk to about your experiment. Pathway network analysis very generally uh, is an any analysis that involves pathway network information. We'll try to define pathways and networks later on, but as you find, many people will have their own definitions, so it's sort of open. Most popular type of pathway enrichment, most popular type of this analysis is a pathway enrichment analysis, but many others are useful. So enrichment analysis essentially deals less with uh, maybe the interactions between the genes and it treats the pathways as a set of genes. So that often causes a little bit of con confusion because people, when they think about pathways, they always have this diagram of balls and arrows in their head. The simplest type of pathway enrichment analysis really deals with pathways as sets of genes. Okay? Uh, we'll go through that uh, a little bit today, and tomorrow we have lectures where people talk more about the network aspect.
So pathways and networks, how do you really compare them? So this is one of the p potential uh, take-homes or messages or ways of interpreting pathway enrichment and pathway and network data. Uh, so this diagram shows you two ways. The, it always centers on the EGFR uh, protein, but then we can talk about the EGFR-related pathway or the EGFR-related network. Uh, so one interpretation is the following. Uh, pathways are collections of highly detailed information that have been collected over time in careful small-scale experiments. And then uh, interactions in pathways are often defined in a very specific molecular way. For example, protein A phosphorylates protein B under certain cellular conditions. And then this is pathway information. Pathway information is often more restricted because not all of the relevant experiments have been done in such a careful way. Uh, but then again, it's pretty high confidence. In contrast, network information uh, is slightly different. So here you see uh, different types of edges between these uh, uh, circles, circles of proteins, and edges could be inhibiting edges or activating edges or maybe just physical interaction edges. So the information in networks is often more vague. And it's also uh, often this little piece of a network is part of a much larger and much more complicated network. So you'll see that in networks you have way more information, but that information is less reliable. So oftentimes these networks are constructed from large-scale, maybe proteomics or genomics experiments, where every individual edge wouldn't be scrutinized as carefully. Okay, so types and paths and network analysis. I'm sorry some of this slide has been cut off. Uh, but in general, the, these are the three major types that we can talk about. The simplest analysis is enrichment of gene sets. So instead of interpreting a particular pathway as a complicated uh, set of interactions, we could just say we only care about the genes or proteins in that pathway, and let's see how many of these genes or proteins are present in our experiment. Um, so, and then the second one is de novo subnetwork construction and discovery. So as we have a, uh, a gene list of interest, uh, can we build new networks within that gene list that represent maybe some sort of biological knowledge? And then the third most complicated uh, uh, area of, uh, of tools over here is pathway-based modeling, in which case we would have a certain pathway as a scaffold, and then we would use our experimental data to verify whether that scaffold holds. For example, uh, can we build inhibiting and activating edges using the data that we have derived from another experiment, and also the pathways that we know uh, from public literature. Okay, so for example, in the, in the context of cancer genome analysis, uh, the applications of these three different techniques would be the following. Uh, if we just do pathway enrichment analysis, then we could ask what biological process in the pathways seem to be altered in this specific type of cancer. Okay, which cancer genes uh, are involved in these pathways and uh, is there a statistically significant overrepresentation of these genes? Uh, the second one, uh, do we detect any de novo pathways or novel pathways that are altered in cancer? And do these uh, de novo pathways correlate some, with some sort of clinically relevant cancer subtypes? And then uh, in the third case, which uh, uses the most information and also depends on the best quality of the cancer uh, pathway data, is whether are the pathway activities altered in a particular patient and are there target, drug targetable pathways in this patient. So here we model the existing experimental information together uh, with the <coughs> pathway structure to make sure that the pathway and the experimental information are in agreement. So in this lecture and the next one, we really mostly talk about the simplest kind of pathway enrichment analysis that just deals with gene sets. Uh, it is the simplest, but it's also the most broadly applicable, and it has the best coverage of data. So probably when you're doing your practical uh, analysis of your own data, this is where you want to start from. However, I totally ex encourage you to look at the other ways of analyzing pathway data as well. Uh, so a little bit of motivation. Why do we want to analyze pathway data instead of just focusing on single genes? So single gene analysis is also very important, but you may want to move to the pathway level because of these reasons. Uh, for example, a pathway analysis improves statistical power. So when you analyze your data gene by gene or protein by protein, you're likely to analyze tens of thousands of units, right? Or maybe if you do proteome-wide, it could be hundreds of thousands. However, when you look at pathways, you can restrict your search base uh, to a narrow set of maybe hundreds of thousands of pathways. And then, therefore, you don't uh, uh, treat your data to so much multiple testing correction, and maybe you'll find 
uh, out some more interesting results that are near the threshold. Uh, then it's more reproducible as well, uh, because uh, instead of looking at single genes across experiments, for example, you look at gene signatures across experiments, and then uh, by virtue of having more genes, you're more likely to capture the same things, even though if your experiments are a little bit variable. Uh, also, pathway information is usually easier to interpret, because uh, instead of looking at an alphabet soup of uh, gene symbols, which can be really confusing and uh, um, and boring sometimes. You, you look at uh, familiar concepts from a biology textbook, such as cell cycle or apoptosis or differentiation, and then interpreting your data like that uh, is better because you, you get to your hypothesis more quickly. Also, ideally, pathway enrichment analysis or any pathway-related approach will uh, perhaps help you in identifying the biological mechanism. Uh, perhaps you'll be able to identify uh, different regulators of your genes, for instance. Uh, or find out uh, the reason for a particular upregulation of a pathway by interpreting your initial experimental design. And, and also we can predict new roles to previously unknown gene. This is called the guilt by association principle. So uh, genes never act alone and if you see a cluster of famous genes in your data, perhaps you can associate some of the function of these famous genes to some other genes that have been previously not been described that well. Uh, so if, uh, if an unknown gene seems to hang out with the many known genes, then maybe it's just like a previously undescribed member of that pathway. But before you go into the pathway analysis, it's actually essential that you uh, treat your experimental data really carefully, because uh, in, in pathway analysis, the principle of garbage in, garbage out holds very well. If your data comes with confounding factors, or there's problems in the data, then you will, you will receive apparently very interesting data from the pathway analysis that could actually be caused by art, uh, experimental artifacts or data production artifacts. So an example that my, uh, my postdoctoral advisor likes to tell is that uh, they were analyzing uh, data from mouse tissue and they saw a, a signal from apoptosis coming up really strongly, which was interesting because apparently that was uh, related uh, to cancer genomics and you know, it's one of the hallmarks of cancer. But instead what turned out was that the, some of the control samples had been left uh, standing on the bench top for a little longer and they started to die. So uh, the apoptosis signal was uh, not really an effect of, uh, of something cancerous going on in the cells, but rather an effect of an experimental processing. So something to do like that to always keep in mind. Uh, and then anything you do with the data normalization will actually contribute to pathway enrichment analysis downstream. Okay, so this is generally the main pipeline. Uh, you collect your genomics data or any other omics data. You carefully normalize and score and interpret it uh, on a single gene level, and then you generate a gene list. This gene list can be longer, it can be shorter. Uh, oftentimes, ranked gene lists are better that, than flat gene lists. And then you broadly learn about the underlying cellular <coughs> mechanism using pathway network analysis. And that involves statistical analysis because you want to make sure that the signals that you're getting are statistically supported, but it also involves visualization because uh, we uh, humans as visual creatures, we, we tend to learn very much from seeing images. And then we can also uh, feed that pathway information back into our literature search to better understand what the genes might be doing. And then ideally, you, you find out a new exciting model about your experiment and publish it in a high impact journal. Right, so what is pathway enrichment analysis? Uh, it can be actually visualized with this really simple Venn diagram. Uh, on the one hand, you'll have your gene list from your experiment that you're working with. And for example, they could be genes that were downregulated in a drug-sensitive brain cancer cell line. Okay? And on the other hand, you have annotated genes from various databases. Uh, and then instead of one Venn diagram circle, there are hundreds or potentially thousands of them, each one of them representing a particular facet of, uh, of biology that, were, that people have curated over time. For example, that could be a gene set known as neurotransmitter signaling, so that would contain all the ion channels and the receptors and things. And then you run statistical tests, you usually run them more than once, um, and then you ask, uh, do my gene list, does my gene list contain more genes of that ion channel uh, family than we would expect by random chance? The, the standard test here is the Fisher's exact test, although other, other tests are potentially useful in various scenarios. And then if that test returns a statistically significant p-value, uh, then you have reason to believe that uh, 
the genes uh, in that list that were enriched in the neurotransmitter signaling family, they were not enriched because of a random chance, but they were there because they explained some sort of biology. And then you build a hypothesis that maybe drug sensitivity in brain cancer has something to do with the reduced neurotransmitter signaling. And then you proceed with uh, analyzing the literature, whether something like that is already known. Now, many problems obviously emerged. Uh, these pathways are not of equal quality. When you do many, many tests, you're more likely to find out something important. But we'll talk about these things in the, in the coming lectures. Okay, so practically speaking, G-Profiler is one of those tools that allows you to do pathway enrichment analysis. Uh, it accepts the gene lists and then uh, spits out these long, longer or shorter lists of uh, different pathways. I have a conflict of interest because this is uh, my PhD work and there will be, uh, there will be more slides about how, use it, how to use it and we'll have uh, a tutorial as well. But basically you'll see that uh, you pasted your gene list up here somewhere and then you, as a result, you receive the list of pathways. Pathways are all often hierarchically related to each other. Uh, you'll get information about uh, the genes involved in these pathways. You get an enrichment p-value, and this little colorful grid tells you what is the type of evidence that supports each gene in that pathway. Um, the problem with pathway analysis, I, I mentioned hierarchy a little bit, and I'll get back to that soon, is any time you have a very meaningful gene list with lots of rich information in it, you will have many pathways that come out of uh, the statistical analysis. So this is just an example. Uh, lots of pathways here, and the list continues all the way to the floor and beyond. And the problem is that they are not distinct. They're not independent. For example, here you'll see a lot of uh, pathways of the same kind, information response, uh, they're slightly phrased differently, but they generally represent the same, same underlying facet of biology. So what, how do we deal with that? Obviously, visualization is one, uh, one feature or one option to proceed with this analysis. Uh, this tool is developed in, in the Bader lab where I did my postdoc, so uh, I've used it uh, many times and find it very, a very good intuitive way of interpreting uh, pathways. This is called an enrichment map. And then uh, the input to this enrichment map is a list of significant enriched pathways. So the statistical analysis has already been performed. And then they have been laid into this network topology where each node or circle represents a pathway. And uh, every time a pathway is connected to another pathway, that means that there are many common genes. So if a pathway shares many common genes, that it also probably shares many many common biological features. So that network analysis allows, us, you, allows you to compress this very long list of uh, sort of similar pathways in, into a network where all these sort of similar pathways are grouped together uh, into clusters in the network space. And that helps you to visualize and interpret the data in a much better way because you don't go through the list, you go through these uh, network uh, modules. Uh, just a little case study about that. Ependomoma is a pediatric and adult uh, brain and ne nervous system cancer, uh, which is used, uh, uh, which is uh, primarily diagnosed uh, and uh, associated uh, through pathology. So no genomics has been involved so far. Uh, however, I was involved in a study uh, where uh, the researchers collected various kinds of omics data about ependomomas. Uh, including methylation and gene expression. And then they uh, performed the various ways of clustering that data to figure out that the actually ependomoma is not a single disease, but is comprised of nine different subtypes. So this nine or eight or 10 is arguable, but it shows uh, strong heterogeneity within, uh, uh, within the, the tumor. And it also has the different clinical features. So one of the subtypes performs better than the other. So it's definitely helpful uh, for uh, diagnosis and uh, and clinical treatment. Now, uh, the task that we were involved in was basically uh, to interpret the biology of these different subtypes in contrast to each other. And obviously, we perform pathway enrichment analysis with uh, an enrichment map. And then this, uh, this figure comes from the paper that was published. Um, and then this enrichment map basically tells you what are the common features and distinct features of these various ependomoma subtypes. And it, uh, I'm showing you it here because it's a good example of how to use enrichment maps to interpret complex data. So instead of looking at one gene list here, we were looking at nine gene lists. And each one of those nine gene lists is represented with a different color. 
So you'll see that you know the red subtype seems to have some associations to cell cycle, and then the blue subtype has some associations to neurotransmitter signaling. Uh, there are specific uh, signaling pathways that are representative of uh, one or more subtypes of ependymoma over here, and so on. So this rich visual representation allows you to understand the heterogeneity of that particular type of brain cancer. Uh, one question, how did you actually build the sequence? I mean, what kind of tools did you use? For this is the enrichment map. Uh, is it tool. the same as the previous? But yeah, the, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. But so, just with different settings and stuff to yes. the colors. So the, the trick here is that uh, in Cytoscape, yeah, okay, so the question was, wh how did I build this map? And the, then the answer is that uh, the Cytoscape has a, um, an app called Enrichment Map, which will be part of one of the tutorials today. Um, and then the, the only major addition here is Cytoscape has the ability to put various charts on nodes. And in this case, uh, it's a pie chart. Yeah. So... Uh, if it's a single color, it's a single color pie chart, but you can see that sometimes this is a pie chart of multiple colors of equal sizes, and each color will represent one cancer type or subtype. Um, so it's, uh, it's very well doable, you just need to do a few extra tricks. So that is a, a, an example or, or a case study of uh, how to use gene expression and methylation and whatever analysis uh, using uh, pathway and network network approaches, especially pathway enrichment analysis. Uh, so as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, there are two major components of this pathway enrichment analysis. One of them is the gene list, and the other one is a collection of gene sets uh, representing various processes and pathways. So first, where do gene lists come from? And then it, actually you guys will know better where gene lists come from because I'm assuming that every one of you here is uh, here because of they want to analyze their own data. So you are responsible for generating your own gene lists. Uh, just a few examples. You do molecular profiling of uh, some sort of experiment using omics technologies. Uh, very commonly people do uh, RNA sequencing of cases and controls, for example. Uh, you can do protein uh, proteomics studies, for example, using mass spectrometry uh, or bio-ID is very common in, in Toronto these days. Uh, in the first case, you identify a gene list, uh, and then sometimes it's just a fixed gene list. You, you draw a threshold and say, these are my interesting genes. I want to analyze these interesting genes compared to the rest of the genes. Uh, more sophisticated approaches also give you gene lists and values, and then you can rank them. My strongest top number one gene has the strongest score, and then the scores start decreasing. Actually, most of the times I would recommend using ranked gene lists in pathway analysis because that gives more information uh, to the analysis procedure and you'll be able to capture more subtle effects. And then you can also do various kinds of ranking and clustering algorithms and they, they might give you gene lists of, of different sizes. Uh, on the other hand, you can also study interactions. So a classical case is the protein-protein uh, interactions. You're interested <coughs> in a particular protein. You have done a, a screen to measure all of its interactions. And then you'll have these interactions as your search space for pathway analysis. Uh, in interaction studies, many times you won't have a, a clear-cut ranking. You, will, you may have just the interactions of the proteins and the non-interactions of the protein. So in that case, you may want to deal with just a flat list. Other ways to do that, genetic screens, for example, knockout libraries, CRISPR is the, uh, is the big new technology these days. Uh, so you can, for example, study uh, the pathways involved in essential genes. You can do genome-wide association studies, uh, single nucleotide uh, variants. Uh, when you analyze cancer genomes, you find driver genes and perhaps want to identify driver pathways that have many mutations and so on and so forth. So gene lists come from a variety of places and the beauty of pathway enrichment analysis is, is that in most times the analysis is the same regardless of the omic data that goes in. What you have to care about is uh, gene identifiers, for example. What do gene lists mean? Uh, this is also a question that uh, every one of you will know better than I do about your particular experiment, but uh, essentially when you do a, uh, an omics experiment, you want your experiment uh, experimental results to reflect some sort of a, a question or, an, uh, or a function that you're studying. So 
maybe you, want, you are interested in a particular set of genes. Maybe you're looking at genes that encode for protein kinases. Maybe you're looking at a particular uh, cell type or disease. And then what you have to care about sometimes is that when you restrict your search base very stringently, then the pathway analysis needs to be tweaked somewhat. One example is that for if uh, your gene list will a priori only contain protein kinases, uh, then you have to adjust your pathway analysis such that it treats the protein kino kinome as your background. Uh, that, that will come out in a, a few later lectures as well. But the, the take-home message here is that if you have a genome-wide uh, analysis and genome-wide results, so any gene in your list could be potentially coming from anywhere in the genome, you're safe and the standard the pathway analysis holds. However, if you restrict yourself to, say, 5,000 genes, and the remaining uh, 13,000 will never have a signal. In that case, you have to worry about your pathway analysis a little because the statistics would be very much biased towards your search space. So the biological questions uh, of a pathway analysis, what do you actually want to accomplish with a gene list of interest? And this is better be part of your experimental design because uh, not always can you re rescue a bad, bad experimental design at the level of pathway analysis. So usually you want to summarize biological processes or other aspects of gene functions in your list of interest. Uh, sometimes you want to perform differential analysis to have uh, samples from uh, diseased individuals, samples from healthy individuals. You want to compare one versus the rest. Sometimes you have a time series and you want to figure out uh, what are the genes that seem to be upregulated towards the end of your time series. Um, other times you may want to find a controller for a process. For example, you're looking for, to find the transcription factor that acts, acts as a master regulator of the genes that you discovered, or a microRNA. Sometimes you're interested in detecting whole new pathways, or at least finding new members of a previously known pathway. And then you can, through that, you can discover new gene function um, um, using the guilt by association principle. And sometimes you want to correlate uh, a disease phenotype uh, to the pathways that you find and maybe prioritize candidate genes for further experimental validations. So the biological answers that can come out of your analysis, in pathway enrichment analysis, you summarize the functions that you get and potentially compare functions that you get from one experiment and the other experiment, like I showed with the pendomoma example. In network analysis, you can predict uh, gene function to new genes or maybe find even new pathways or functional modules. Um, and in regulatory network analysis, you're interested in <coughs> how these genes came to be or whether there's a master regulator that controls these genes of interest. Uh, so as I mentioned, there are these two major components that go into the pathway enrichment analysis, the gene list that you have constructed from your previous analysis and pathways that come from scientific literature. And then there's a, not a black box, but an orange box over here. Uh, which will give you enriched pathways. And then there are various tools that do it in different ways. Uh, I'm t I will talk about G-Profiler, but Veronique later on will talk about GSEA. These are somewhat different approaches with the same underlying goal. And then the, the techniques um, that you need to worry about, basically, is how do you make sure that the gene identifiers are good? Uh, and where do you get the pathway inf information? And how do you select pathway information uh, for your analysis? So first about um, gene lists and specifically gene and protein identifiers. Identifiers are ideally unique, stable names or numbers that help track database records. Uh, for example, you know, from the real world, everyone has a social insurance number and government agencies use these numbers to track us down. Um, genes also similarly have uh, various uh, numbers uh, and identifiers, but the main problem is that there are many different databases. <laughs> Pardon? Are you from the former Russian <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, tracking down, for example, um, did anyone receive tax forms recently? <laughs> All right. So, so social insurance numbers are uh, unique, and then th that's one of the primary numbers that we need to worry about. But phone number is another way. Uh, the problem with genes is that uh, uh, there are many different databases. So genes will have many different names. And besides databases, they will also have names that people have given them. Uh, and these names change over time. So that causes a lot of trouble. Um, and then what you ideally want to do is you want to 
select the gene identifier that has is stable and will be stable for times to come to be able to future-proof your analysis. But that is kind of a problem because, uh, you know, some databases commit to having stable identifiers, others don't. And if you only deal with th things like gene symbols, then these are, uh, these are potentially traps because gene symbols will change. They're nom nominated by a committee and the, the committee seems to change their mind all the time. So if you take a gene list from, say, five years ago, there's a good chance that, uh, you know, five or ten percent of these genes have changed their names. Uh, in a good chance, you'll just get an error in the pathway database uh, saying that gene, this gene doesn't exist. But in a bad scenario, you'll get a different gene. So here are some different types of gene identifiers commonly used uh, for human and other species. And then the red ones are recommended. So ensemble IDs are relatively stable, undrized genes are stable. Um, but then sometimes like uh, P53, which is a symbol, TP53, is not often stable because people find out a new function and they assign some sort of a short name to that gene. Uh, so the problem with so many IDs is that uh, somewhere there's a master table that connects them all, but not all pathway analysis software will have that master table. So pathway analysis software will maybe deal with only a handful of different genes, a gene t identifier types, and then ignore the rest. And then you have different uses, you can just, if you have one gene, it's easy, you just search until you find the right identifier, but if you have a hundred or a thousand genes, you don't really want to do that one by one. Uh, so in that case, you want to use maybe a software that does, does that for you, but in most of the cases, you still have to uh, look at the remaining genes that didn't find an identifier and map them one by one if you want to achieve uh, a perfect coverage of a gene list. Um, so when you map different identifiers, one of the main challenges is to map them correctly. Be aware of genes that have multiple identifiers of the same sort because they could point to whole different genes. Uh, here's an example of the problem of both studied gene P53, which is called TP53 or P53 or GRP53 or all these other things, uh, depending on the organisms. Um, another aspect is that if you happen to work with spreadsheets, then uh, Excel has this nice feature of converting anything that looks like a date to a date. And there are many genes, or at least a handful of genes, that look like dates. So OCT4 is a stem cell regulator that consistently gets converted into October 4. And there have been systematic studies in the recent literature that have pointed out that a very large fraction of high-impact publications have errors like that embedded in their supplementary tables. As I mentioned before, you'll probably have uh, problems reaching 100% uh, coverage when you have these large omics data sets. And just when you do pathway enrichment analysis, pay attention to the error messages. And maybe if there's only a small number, then go back uh, to common databases, cross-check these references, and pick the one that's, that's the right one. Uh, so here's uh, one embarrassing example of a, uh, of a nature study about 15 years ago or, or 10 where they, they had this whole big study about, uh, about an, an interesting regulator, an interesting gene, only to find out later that they had confused the gene symbol and they were talking about an entirely different gene. So um, the nomenclature is different uh, and it's difficult to work with, especially that, uh, that some genes have been historically called something else and then that something else is now assigned to a new gene. So it's a big mix. Fortunately, there are various uh, systematic ID mapping services. One of them is, uh, is incorporated in a G-Profiler set. It's called G-Convert. And then this essentially downloads the entire Biomart uh, ensemble database, seeks up all the identifiers in that Biomart and constructs these big master tables to be able to associate um, a mixture of different IDs from various uh, databases to any, any given one single database. And then there's probably hundreds of different identifiers across the species that, uh, that are covered. So there's just a, a list over here. But regardless of this automated procedure, it will still fail to find some symbols because people have been using various aliases over time. So in this case, pay attention to the error messages. And if, if there are many, then just go and double check them uh, recommendedly in multiple different databases until you find the very right symbol. Um, there's, a, there's a helper tool in G-Profiler that will tell you that uh, it found ambiguous ID mappings. And then 
it will give you a list of these ambiguous ID mappings and potential choices, so you can check the bullet points uh, of these most likely choices and maybe ignore some of them. So at least you won't introduce additional errors into your, uh, into your pathway analysis pipeline. So a few recommendations. When you have protein lists or gene lists and you don't really care about uh, splice isoforms, then map everything to the entree gene IDs, which are uh, numbers, uh, or, or official gene symbols when using a spreadsheet. So official gene symbols are a little bit more problematic because um, evidence shows that they still change over time. Uh, if you do uh, need 100% coverage, then just manually curate missing IDs and use multiple resources, you know, gene cards, ensemble, species-specific IDs, uh, UCSC genome, and so on. And be very careful of Excel spreadsheets because they tend to introduce particular types of errors. You can uh, paste gene, gene lists or any text uh, to force no conversions, and it's, it's a good habit to do so. Okay, so just a little uh, summary, what have we learned? Genes and the products have so many different identifiers, uh, and unfortunately, it, it's only half a joke, but like uh, the majority of bioinformatics, you often spend mapping different identifiers and merging tables. There are ID mappings uh, available, and uh, you should always try to use the most commonly used identifiers for your gene lists. Okay, so the second component of pathway enrichment analysis is obviously pathways. And pathways is a very broad concept. Everyone has their own ideas about it. Here we mostly talk about gene sets. And these pathways, uh, or gene sets, uh, there are many uh, resources for them, but the, one of the primary ones is a gene ontology. Um, there is, there's the databases, lots of databases. For example, the reactome, every species will have their own pathway database. So there is a lot of resources to navigate the, among. So pathways is just one aspect of various uh, gene identifiers and gene information that you can gather. Uh, and most of the time, we really talk about pathways as biological processes or molecular pathways, but there are many other annotations that you may be interested in. Uh, for instance, uh, gene ontology, besides talking about biological processes, also has information about molecular functions or cell locations. Depending on what you do, you actually may want to treat uh, chromosome location uh, as a feature of your genes, or disease associations from databases such as OMIM. Uh, DNA properties may be very interesting in the context of, uh, you know, the, the framework of pathway analysis. For example, whether there are transcription factor binding sites uh, or encode peaks around it. Or there you could look at protein properties as labels or annotations of genes. Does, does that protein have a particular domain uh, or a particular post-translational modification site? Or interactions can also be used in the same framework. However, we mostly talk about uh, pathway analysis in the context of biological processes and molecular uh, functions. So, what is the gene ontology? Uh, the gene ontology is basically like a dictionary. Uh, it's a dictionary of, uh, of common biological uh, uh, phenomena, and importantly, it's a hierarchical dictionary. So, at the top of the hierarchy, there's something very general, like the biological process, and then it spreads out to more and more detailed biological processes in, towards uh, the leaves of the tree, so to say. And examples of this would be protein kinase, uh, which is a particular protein with a particular function, uh, or the process apoptosis, or the cell component membrane. Uh, and then bio, uh, the gene ontology is designed to be agnostic of vari various species. So uh, the dictionary will, uh, will cover the biology of plants and the biology of unicellular organisms and, uh, and humans and everything uh, in between. So an ontology is a formal system of describing knowledge, and in this case the knowledge is everything biology. Uh, this is a visualization of the GO structure. So this is something um, a computer scientist called a directed acyclic graph, which is like a tree, but the, instead of being a tree, any, any leaf in the tree can have one parent or more parents. And then this is a, a good way of representing knowledge because we have uh, more specific terms of biology towards uh, the bottom of, uh, of the tree and very general things in the top of the tree. So here we have B cell apoptosis, uh, which is a part of apoptosis, which is uh, a kind of program cell death, which is a kind of a cellular process in the top. So this is how we represent knowledge that has been accumulated over decades of research. Um, and then 
gene annotations will be associated to that ghost structure. Uh, gene ontology uh, covers uh, three major branches. Uh, so the most inter interesting for us in the context of pathway analysis is biological process. But then there's also molecular function and cellular component. And each one of those three branches will have thousands of uh, terms associated to them. So here are the examples. Uh, cell division is a biological process. Glucose 3, glucose 6 phosphate isomerase activity is a molecular function. And then there are various uh, cell components here, like the inner membrane and outer membrane and so on. So these are the types of keywords that have been <coughs> built into the Go, uh, Go tree. And uh, we can annotate genes to them. And by using these gene annotations, we have access to pathway enrichment analysis. Where do Go terms come from? Uh, they obviously come from uh, big human efforts. Uh, Go terms are added by gene ontology editors. The headquarters uh, of gene ontology um, is at the European Bioinformatics Institute. And also, uh, Go terms are maintained there, and uh, additional information is created. Often that times that information is also coming from species-specific research groups. As I mentioned, Go is supposed to be species agnostic, so various research groups will contribute to the Go tree. Um, and then this is a very uh, alive and developing organism, so to say. You can see how, how just the vocabulary has been increasing over time. And then this is really important uh, because you don't want to use outdated resources. Uh, for instance, between the, la the last three, three years, or 2012 and 15, there was about you know, a quarter of increase uh, in some areas uh, of, the, of the Go tree. It also reflects how science is progressing. You know, we publish more and more papers every year. Uh, there are more and more new technologies to explore, explore life. And in particular, we have all these omics technologies that give us more power in, in analyzing many things at the same time. OK. so. Only one part of the Go is the tree, so that's only the pure dictionary. But what is more interesting to us is how we use that dictionary to describe gene function. So this is called um, annotating genes with the Go information. And uh, genes are linked or associated with Go terms by trained curators at genome databases. So these trained curators lead, read a lot of literature, and every time there's a claim in a paper, they evaluate it critically, and then if if the claim is solid, then they will basically draw an arrow between a particular gene and the particular term in that vocabulary. And then this process is ongoing. And uh, as you know, uh, scientific literature is growing at a great pace. So more and more of these gene annotations emerge. And uh, genes will have multiple annotations per gene. Uh, one reason is that uh, genes are rarely involved in doing just one thing, but they often do many different things. And then the other reason was the hierarchy aspect. Because uh, Go terms are structured hierarchically, uh, any, any genes associated to a particular term will be also associated to all the terms above it. And then Go annotations will have various quality labels to them. For example, if, if a gene was associated to a process uh, in a knockout experiment, it will be more strong evidence than if it was associated in a data clustering experiment. So in gene ontology, there's something called um, evidence codes, which will essentially give a quality label to how well the curators trusted the data. Uh, so in terms of hierarchical annotation that I just mentioned, this is uh, an example. Uh, Aurora kinase B is known to be involved in B-cell apoptosis. So the direct annotation that the curators gave to that gene was they, they draw an arrow between Aurora kinase B and B-cell apoptosis. But due to the nature of uh, the Go hierarchy, uh, all these other arrows were added as well. Because if a gene is part of that particular specific biological process, then by definition, it is also part of all these other parent processes that are more general. So this is how you see why a pathway analysis will give you hugely redundant results if you have a rich gene list. Because besides B-cell apoptosis showing up in your significance analysis, all these other guys will be tested for enrichment as well, and they will show up. Uh, so this is where the redundancy starts to come in. Uh, the other aspect is the, uh, the annotation quality. Mm, oftentimes, uh, literature is curated by human curators, but obviously they have the limitations. The teams are, are not uh, as large as they should be. So other times, uh, electronic annotation occurs. And then these annotations are given to genes 
through algorithmic means. And they are often not even validated one by one by curators because people have time limitations and so on. And so the thing that you can do about it is pay attention. If your favorite gene is only supported by, uh, by electronic annotation, be more careful about it. And if you're doing a large scale analysis, you can also choose to opt out from these low quality electronic annotations that are actually quite prevalent um, among human genes, for example. So the key point is be aware of how your gene was associated to a particular process and you, you can oftentimes even track it back to the original source or, or the paper. So here are a couple of different evidence types. Uh, the one uh, to pay attention to is inferred from electronic annotation or it's called IEA sometimes. And then there are these various experimental uh, codes that reflect what experiments the original researchers were doing. Maybe they were doing cell knockouts or maybe they were doing evolutionary studies or they were looking at genetic interactions. So all of that is ideally captured in the gene ontology annotations. And sometimes it's just based on, on uh, literature curation where an author has stated something about a gene in the paper and then there's no, no concrete experimental evidence about it. So th this is a landscape that you want to study in very specific cases where you, you want to study where where your gene annotation is coming from. Uh, as I showed before, evidence codes are sort of shown with this uh, nice colorful uh, legend in G profiler. So uh, the darker, redder colors are usually represent stronger evidence from, uh, from biology, while the lighter or bluer tones show that it's mostly computational evidence that was feeding into these annotations. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, gene ontology is designed to be species agnostic. And then it will actually depend on how well a particular species is studied uh, to, to analyze the various uh, gene annotations that are involved. Uh, gene ontology also does a, a lot of cross curation. So if a particular gene is strongly conserved and the evidence only exists in worm, then some of that evidence may be carried over uh, to human gene annotations because uh, you know, maybe it was involved in a very core biological process. And that is reflected in uh, in the various evidence codes. So in essence, uh, every, every species database would ideally contribute to the gene ontology and they would, uh, the, the annotations would uh, show up um, in the master gene ontology table. And there's always new species annotations and development. What you uh, may want to know is that obviously all the species have different coverages to them. Uh, the, the, human, the human genome and proteome um, is studied the most and obviously it has the most annotations followed by common model organisms. Uh, obviously human, uh, human experiments will have uh, fewer direct experimental evidence and more computational, experimental, computational evidence inferred from other species because uh, there are certain types of experiments that you won't be able to do in human. Um, so you, you can see actually how much of that evidence is coming from computational in inference in, in, uh, in say human. So whenever you do your pathway analysis, it's quite likely that most of the information going into that analysis has been derived uh, from computational analysis rather than direct experiments. Here's just a, uh, a list of various databases uh, of the different species, and you don't need to know that unless you're directly working with one of those species. And then Go software tools uh, are very abundant. Uh, there is... Uh, probably dozens of tools that only do pathway enrichment analysis, the simple, simplest kinds, and they will have their different uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, one of the main things that you need to pay attention to is how frequently they get updated. And uh, we had a study last year where we wanted to know how frequently uh, different tools are updated uh, and how that potentially affects uh, interpretation of the data uh, what, that you get when you analyze your data using these tools. And then the question we asked was, do gene annotation databases have best before dates? Uh, and it turns out that yes, they do. Uh, this, uh, this figure tells you uh, uh, how frequently a particular tool uh, has been updated uh, using the color scheme. And then uh, on the y-axis, you show, uh, we show how many citations that tool has. Uh, and then the big elephant in the room is called David which had uh, 2,500 citations last year, yet all of these citations were based on data that was five years old. 
because uh, David was updated in 2010 at the time and everyone kept on using it, but they were missing out on a lot of recent, uh, uh, recent uh, discoveries. So we really wanted to quantify how much people were missing out in these 2,500 papers. And then we performed you know, various pathway enrichment analysis. In particular, this is uh, analysis of glioblastoma driver genes. Glioblastoma is a fatal brain cancer. Uh, and then we found that uh, when you use uh, out-of-date software, particularly from 2011, compared to a recently updated software in 2016, uh, then the intersect uh, is 20%. So 20% of the pathways uh, that you find today, you would be able to find with an outdated tool. And then the remaining 75% uh, is new pathways that you only find when you use uh, up-to-date software. And then there's about 5% of pathways that change definitions or names that were captured by these old tools, but no longer were captured by the new tools. Uh, so the take home here is that these 2600 papers are completely out of date when they were published and that that is kind of a problem uh, as a user of these tools you want to check when the data was last pulled in from the gene ontology uh, as a developer you want to pull in data as frequently as possible uh, and as a funder uh, like a grant agency you need to create grants that allow to support software um, so uh, I think this is quite important. Um, another message is that uh, David was updated after a Twitter storm, uh, so at least we, we changed something. And maybe they keep on updating the software, and uh, there's a reason why David is very popular, because it's quite intuitive and a lot of people use it. So out of the other tools, I guess with the exception of Twitter 5 there, uh, which one would you suggest for like a so, you know, I mean, now David is updated too, but mm -hmm. which one would you suggest if David? Uh, so Panther is a, is a tool that's maintained by the Gene Ontology Consortium. Mm -hmm. So I think that is a good choice mm -hmm. because they know what they're doing. And I think they update like very frequently. Go with Gene Ontology itself, I think it's updated daily, like the vocabulary. And then, uh, you know, the gene annotations depend on the species, but they're also very frequently updated, many times a year at least. And in terms of like... Um, uh, how intuitive it is and stuff, uh, how does it compare uh, to David? Panther is pretty good. I think you just paste in the gene list and it spits out the results. So, so far I've uh, mostly discussed gene ontology as your primary source of pathway data. Uh, there's obviously other, other pathway tools. Probably if you count all the various ones, there's, m there's more than 100. Uh, pathway Commons is a resource developed at the Bader Lab, which is a an aggregate resource or a meta resource of various different pathways. Uh, oh well, it actually lists more than 500 different pathway databases and uh, you can collect these meta sets in very intuitive text-based formats where you get all the interactions within a pathway um, with a one click that have been aggregated across these various uh, pathway databases. I will only briefly tell about, you know, I actually told about already the various different functions that you want to use as gene labels to do a similar type of pathway enrichment analysis. Uh, molecular functions and cell locations are, are probably relevant to many experiments. Uh, and then all the other things that you can study as well. Basically, the trick is the same. You will uh, derive a list of genes that have a, a particular gene association or maybe a chromosomal region. And then you test whether your list of genes from the experiment has a statistical enrichment. So the framework is almost always the same. Uh, but we generally recommend to start uh, with, with pathways and biological processes because it's very easy to overwhelm yourself if you choose a hundred different types of databases into your pathway enrichment analysis you will have hundreds or thousands of results that are difficult to interpret so start with the, uh, the most intuitive ones first and then progress into the areas where you feel that your experiment needs the most interpretation okay uh, so what have we learned mm, pathways and mostly come from gene ontology and dedicated pathway databases. Gene ontology in particular is a classification system and a dictionary for all biological concepts. Annotations are contributed to by many groups. Genes will usually have more than one annotation because of hierarchy, but also because of functional redundancy and functional multiplicity. Uh, some genomes are way more annotated than others, especially if you happen to work on an exotic model organism. Uh, 
you may have trouble or you may have all the annotations that are coming from the next closest model organism. Um, annotations come from manual resources, uh, sources which are stronger obviously, and then electronic uh, sources which uh, uh, should be treated with a grain of salt sometimes. Uh, and then the gene ontology also has a version called Go Slim, which I didn't really talk about, but that Go Slim uh, is, a, is a slimmer version or a narrower version of the entire gene ontology, which should cover the main uh, concepts. And these Go Slims come in various flavors. You have a Go Slim for yeast and a mammalian one and so on. And then there are, there are many other ad additional attributes that you can potentially use for pathway analysis, and then you, you can pull them from genome databases such as Ensemble or or encode uh, DCC or so on. So I showed you this um, diagram earlier where step one, collect data, step two, process data, step three, have a gene list, uh, step four, learn about the underlying mechanism using pathway and network approaches. Uh, however, this is actually you know, a part of a way more complicated diagram where in blue you have the various omics <coughs> techniques, in orange uh, you have the ways of uh, analyzing these omics uh, results, and then it really spreads out into various areas of pathway and network analysis where you can identify interesting pathways using these, uh, uh, these enrichment approaches. You can identify interesting networks by, by linking genes in your list to other genes because of known interactions. Uh, and then you can drill down to the potential mechanisms often using various visualization techniques such as the enrichment map. Uh, so with that, I'd like to conclude.